Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I would like to welcome you all here for the opening of our 2010 Microsoft Research eScience Workshop. And uh, we're very happy to uh, have everyone here. My name is Harold Javid, and I'm uh, co-chair of the event this year, along with uh, Carolyn Remick, if you want to join me, Carolyn. And uh, we're very happy to have you all here. She's going to make some opening comments, and then we'll tell you a few things about life. <laughs> you didn't tell me that I had to explain life at the end of this. Um, it's my great pleasure on behalf of Berkeley Water Center to welcome you here to this year's eScience Conference. Uh, Berkeley Water Center promotes interdisciplinary collaborative research on water-related themes, and we're a joint venture of the College of Engineering at UC Berkeley, the College of Natural Resources, and the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. We've had the great pleasure to work with our partners at Microsoft Research to develop some new data management tools that have helped us tremendously in managing ecological and environmental data. Access to these tools has changed the way we've explored research and asked questions, what if and how do we do this, with greater ease, and the onerous tasks of integrating complex data sets has developed in actually a sense of play rather than a sense of drudgery. This theme, uh, the theme for the conference was born out of discussions about the wide range of research that falls under the Berkeley Water Center's umbrella and the diverse computing needs and challenges that our researchers have. I hope that you'll be able to attend the keynote session on Wednesday when we'll be highlighting the fine research that's done in different aspects of the Berkeley campus. Until then, I'm sure, though, you'll enjoy the tremendously rich agenda that Harold has lined up, and I'm sure you'll be inspired by the work of your colleagues. I now have to go on to introduce our speaker, uh, Malcolm Atkinson, uh, about whom I have mixed feelings. <laughs> So Malcolm was, was, when I was doing the UK e-science program, uh, Malcolm was really, uh, how do I describe it, the first heavyweight computer scientist? Uh, no, that's, that's perhaps not flattering. <laughs> <laughs> but it's accurate. <laughs> no, but Mal Malcolm was very, very helpful and supportive in, in, in getting the computer science community engaged with me on the e-science venture. And, uh, was the director of the National E-Science Center in Edinburgh, which is where my mixed feelings come from. Because Malcolm, unfortunately, has an extensive knowledge of, of, of malt whiskies and uh, uh, was responsible for leading me astray on more than one occasion. Uh, but actually enjoyable at the time, next morning was not so clear, right? Uh, in many ways. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Malcolm uh, is well known in the database community, but uh, more recently he's been taking the role uh, of uh, the, when the core program's funding uh, for e-science in the UK ended formally, he took on the role of the e-science envoy, which was actually to, to maintain uh, the initiative and momentum of e-science in the UK, uh, despite there not being an earmarked pot of funding, which is always very difficult. Uh, and uh, I have attended uh, the e-science all hands meeting which we started in 2002 uh, last year in Oxford and it really was remarkable to see the community still still working together and continuing even though there wasn't a, 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 a funded e-science budget. We're hopeful things will change because there was a review of the e-science program um, uh, just recently led by Dan Atkins uh, and it was an international review at, uh, and they came at the conclusion uh, and I think that links to the title of Malcolm's talk. They call the UK e-science program a jewel, which I was pleased to see. Uh, otherwise, they might take back my CBE. Uh, <laughs> so um, that refers to Malcolm's title today, uh, the UK e-science program, a jewel or a thousand flowers. Malcolm, very pleased to welcome you. Well, thank you very much, Tony, for your kind introduction. And um, I claim no responsibility whatsoever for leading you astray. You can do it all by yourself. Uh, 
But um, it wasn't the whiskey, it was that uh, little crisp that you ate that was a bad crisp, yes. Yes. So um, it's funny that you should mention the um, uh, International Review of E-Science for the uh, Combined Research Councils, RCUK. Um, oh, by the way, people aren't quite as red as this. It's uh, the, a the problem with a projector. Um, but um, this is a very fine report and um, uh, well worth reading and I thought um, I should uh, uh, draw your attention to it uh, and I will uh, tell, ma make other copies available but this is a particularly a copy I'm giving to Tony because of all his hard work making it start. So... The point I'm going to try is, what I'm going to try is to try and tell a story. And you have to understand this story uh, is set in the age of the div digital revolution. And um, I'm going to talk about how UK science began and how it changed because Tony asked me to talk about UK science and um, wearing my uh, UK science envoy hat, I felt I had to try and talk about the whole of UK science and not just the little bit I knew well about. Uh, so, of course, I asked my friends, uh, send me two or three points about the way things have changed for you, and they deluged me with huge collections of, um, of slides uh, all at the last moment. Uh, so, uh, your friend, one's friends stay just about the same. So I want to go back and tell the story from the beginning, uh, the, uh, the genesis moment um, of e-science uh, is uh, in uh, 2000 when I think partly as a result of a trend in Europe called the Lisbon Accord and partly as a result of John Taylor's experience uh, leading research in Hewlett Packard, um, the idea uh, of e-science um, was turned into the word e-science and a successful uh, flag uh, to obtain money from the government. And um, we're told now that the government spent too much money, but this isn't a bit of the money that was too much spent. Uh, they, uh, this was very wisely spent, as the report that I've just referred to uh, says very clearly. Well, e-science appeared as a name in 2000. But it's clearly something that's been going on a long while. It's always very hard to decide when something starts. Um, and, uh, and I like to think of people uh, calculating orbits uh, so that uh, other uh, like N Newton can come up with uh, uh, models that explain them. Uh, a remarkable task in um, the uh, 16th uh, century. Um, I'm also struck by the heroic effort of Dennis Noble, uh, which he describes well in his book, The Music of Life, uh, to uh, do a little computing about a bit of early systems biology. Um, but it uh, resulted in two papers in Nature. Uh, so it is nice to uh, see the continuity and uh, the, the titles of the papers are in my notes. The, I don't think the word e-science was used until 2000, but I think it took off as a meme in the um, Richard Dawkins sense. It's really been flying well ever since. And I think uh, we, we, we should look at uh, why that was. So uh, there is unfortunately you know, a, a plethora of, of, um, uh, of abbreviations and... Um, uh, but I will try and avoid those by putting up little blue labels which explain what they are. And one of the crucial things that, um, that happened from the very start was that the money was spread out across all subjects. And uh, one particular part of the, uh, the story um, was uh, providing uh, the resources for organizing the and coordinating the, the, what we called the core program. And 
I'm going to particularly draw attention to what that achieved and what has come from that, because people tend to talk about the projects, and, and I think it's quite nice to look at the 10 years on look of that. So how did we get started? First of all, uh, we had uh, some uh, very fine leaders who chose a set of catalysts, the uh, uh, re regional and national center, um, and uh, gave them a set of tasks to do, uh, basically to build the community and to deploy the infrastructure. I think we were all going to engage in building a UK grid together initially. And uh, one of the things that we found we all were doing was learning what e-science was and how to do it. And I don't think that's changed today. It's a, uh, it's a continuous process. We were also given some starter software to get started. We had a CD, and on it was uh, Condor, uh, Globus, and SRB. What was more important than the software was that it linked us to those communities uh, represented by the leaders there. Um, and they certainly were very, very generous in the early years in coming across and, and working with us and uh, also in uh, accepting us uh, there. But the vision at this point was that we were going to build a monoculture. Uh, we were going to have a, a, an environment where we were all using the same things. Uh, what I can say is that every one of those technologies is still in use and every one of them is doing useful work. Uh, many universities now use Condor uh, uh, to submit large numbers of jobs to around the university and uh, some people have replaced SRB with IRODs but, and, uh, but these sorts of things still go on. There were projects, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about them, but the initial projects were there as the drivers uh, and the uh, centers were, were in part to help enable these projects and to find common ground in the projects uh, that we could, we could support more efficiently. And each research council put together its set of projects. That's the six uh, from the EPSRC. Uh, there were um, a, another uh, group uh, from, uh, there were two from uh, the uh, particle physics uh, and astronomy uh, research council. And then uh, there were a, a, a whole number, seven I think, uh, initially with the uh, National Environmental Research Council. Uh, a particularly successful program, a very transformative program. Um, prior to uh, that, um, NERC, the, Nat the Natural Environment uh, Research Council, had not received um, proposals with computer scientists in them. And then they had a whole succession of proposals where half the people were computer scientists and it resulted in the first three years in 13 papers in Nature. Uh, so it was a successful strategy. I won't go on to, to list the starter projects in the other areas. So uh, when we started, eScience was a destination. There was a definite sense that it was somewhere we could get to. Uh, in political terms, we were supposed to get there in five years. Um, in our intellectual mind, we realized it would take longer than that, uh, but it was nevertheless a, a journey to a promised land, um, and we had all sorts of wonderful ideas about what it would be like when we got there. Indeed, it, they were so, uh, we were so enthusiastic at the start that it was more like a nirvana uh, for research uh, than... Uh, any uh, normal research environment. Uh, transformative um, as e-science was, it wasn't quite as transformative as that. Um, so 
what happened after we got started? Well, here's a map of the initial few that were chosen as the catalysts, and, and then uh, if we look a, a few years on, eight years on, there's a, there's a lot more, and by the ten years on, uh, we see uh, a lot of dots on the map. And I don't believe I've drawn all the dots on the map that are centers which are supporting people doing e-science, whether they call it supporting people doing e-science, some say e-research, uh, some say um, digital institute. Uh, but the uh, activity is going on in many places. And those dots are tip of the iceberg effects because they represent communities around them. In, in Edinburgh, we work with um, virtually all the universities and many other institutions in Scotland, as well as working outside Scotland. And it's certainly the case that every one of those dots is working with a large community uh, and, and a growing one. Which in itself naturally moves towards diversity. And um, if uh, people have looked at uh, attempts to uh, identify diversity, one always has to try and do it by sampling because we can't visit all the dots and count all the species at each of the dots in the time available. I think you would uh, all go uh, soundly to sleep. So what I've tried to do is to do a fair sample. And I'm starting uh, with the uh, dot here that began as Oxford um, eScience uh, Centre. And um, we see it progresses um, from that to the Oxford e-research centre uh, and grows a building. There were no buildings when we started. And uh, has, uh, as leader, um, Andrew Vethan, who you saw was leading uh, the core program at the start, and also um, uh, Dave DeRua sitting here at the front uh, dealing with his, his texts. And it did many things. And, and I won't be telling you about all of the things, but one of them, uh, for example, is the systems biology. And that is a continuation of that systems biology that we hear talked about in uh, Dennis Noble's book in 1958. So uh, you can see that we were building on uh, the past. We we'll also uh, see an example of building the future here. Uh, a group in Oxford is doing the algorithms uh, for uh, using the um, square kilometer array telescope that is going to be built in South Africa or, or Australia. Uh, they were looking at the algorithms for uh, essentially generating images from it. Uh, more variety appears in a virtual research environment. One of the uh, ideas that developed well in the program uh, for uh, people accessing ancient documents um, or, and being able to discuss them. I've tried to use the animations to roughly give a hint of order and the arrows to give a, a hint of, of, of some of the influences. Uh, but these are very approximate because you can't present that in the, the time available. But here we see another example, the Beasley collection uh, and uh, image recognition uh, is, as, a, as a tool to help archaeologists. The uh, next thing that we see is that... Uh, Coordination and planning continues. Uh, for example, the uh, Economic and uh, Social Sciences Research Council uh, appointed uh, Dave DeRuer uh, to uh, uh, develop its uh, strategy with the help of the other characters you see uh, pictured there. And um, there is also uh, clearly an influence and a benefit uh, in uh, collaborations with a company that is very kindly looking after us today, um, and uh, that uh, international connections uh, are, are normal. The other thing that the, the regional, uh, originally a regional centre has done, is formed a regional club of, of, of people active in the field. And here we see another example of things growing. And 
we see four dots there, and it should be eight dots now, um, but I've been pleading for the extra four dots uh, from my esteemed colleagues for a while and haven't got them yet. Um, but uh, but I, I have seen them on the map, and they include Yukon, Bath, and um, uh, King's College London, which I will come to in a moment, and I can't remember the other two. Brunel, sorry, Brunel, it's only, another th so it's only three more so far. Uh, this was a very fine example um, of an environmental activity, uh, um, climateprediction.net, in two senses, because it ran a huge amount and is still continuing to run a huge amount of, of model years, 83 uh, million model years, and uh, still 54,000 active hosts at the time I sampled it on Saturday. Um, but it also has done a great deal to connect people uh, with the story. This is led uh, by uh, Miles Allen, pictured here. Uh, I forgot to let, put his name against it. I meant to put everybody's names against it, so as people looking at the text later uh, would know. Moving uh, up to the uh, northeast, uh, Newcastle. Um, th originally, this centre called itself uh, Northeast East Science. Uh, uh, regional centre. I've left the regional out because it overwrote uh, uh, Paul's uh, face if I did uh, put it in. Um, and um, one of the very significant activities going on there is systems biology again and they put particularly work on ageing and there's a great deal of ageing going on but I couldn't find a nice image for that. Uh, so I, I moved on to the next one of the big activities that I, I've, I saw there and that was the uh, gold project, uh, helping uh, industrial chemists uh, be more productive. And one of the very interesting things we see at different sites is people developing particular skill sets and reapplying them. And one of the particular concerns uh, that the Newcastle team, that everybody gets involved in distributed systems, everybody gets involved in data, but then you take a special viewpoint. One of the particular viewpoints they, they, they worked on there was the uh, privacy and access control, how you can enable people to work on uh, chemicals in a collaborative environment without giving information away uh, to uh, people outside each consortium. And, of course, uh, the centres also engage regionally uh, to communicate uh, knowledge and, and, and stimulate activity around them. And uh, the, um, uh, the example uh, that uh, uh, Paul um, developed with Microsoft's help um, is well known to you because he's given a talk about it before and I won't go into any more detail. Um, another uh, thing we see here is the Carmen project uh, looking at uh, neuroinformatics and building uh, shared collections of methods and data, uh, and then an environmental uh, project message, and one of the latest projects that's going on uh, here and is going on for a, a while because um, the uh, Newcastle was successful in winning a digital economy hub is the, their work on uh, social inclusion through the digital economy. And I think it's, it, it's really interesting to see you know, the, 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 the passage of, of methods and techniques coming down, uh, for example, into uh, handling more sensors than the ones that were originally handled in message, in handling the uh, RFID tags to know which things someone is using and making certain that you put the right bit of the recipe up there if they are someone who is as forgetful as a typical professor and can't remember uh, that they're making a salad and not a stew you have to keep reminding them uh, and uh, you uh, or whatever uh, so it's um, they I'm moving uh, back to the uh, the great when London uh, to uh, talk a little bit about three uh, places in London. The, the one that was an official centre was uh, the London E-Science Centre. Uh, for a while it changed its name from being the E-Science Centre and it's now changed back to the E-Science Centre again. Uh, so at least I didn't have to trace the name change this time. Uh, 
the, one of the projects there was DiscoveryNet, uh, and it had a huge uh, take up of uh, activity, won awards, produced a company, and uh, the company has now been acquired by another company, and it has a substantial amount of business, and Aikiguo is back in uh, the department uh, cooking uh, cloud-based uh, models of how you do all this uh, better. Um, and again, message was led by John Pollock, who I couldn't find a picture of, uh, from uh, Imperial. Uh, we saw a message up in uh, Newcastle, and I wanted to draw attention to the, uh, the multi-site. This is just two of the many sites involved. Moving across London a little way uh, to University College, um, several characters there have, have, have developed a very strong e-science and computational science activity. Uh, one is Peter Coveney, who's, uh, who initially led the project Reality Grid and um, has um, moved on to, uh, well, one of the things he did was um, demonstrate internationally connected computing, and he goes on to do that a great deal more, and uh, he also uh, showed the value of urgent computing in, in, in medical contexts, and is now uh, one of the prime movers in a global consortium uh, to uh, build the virtual uh, physiological uh, human. Another person at UCL, I think he was at, at King's College London initially uh, at the start of the program. People move about as well. I now realize how difficult it is to be a historian. Uh, you, you have to keep re making judgments about where to put things. Um, but um, this is another example of a successful program. It started from two projects and uh, turned into a company. And again, uh, the work has returned. Here we see uh, Mike Leite's work uh, in, um, at UCL, and this is uh, social science mapping uh, to try and understand things using uh, mechanisms like uh, surveys connected with radio programs in this particular case, and in the previous case it was uh, Twitter feeds uh, from uh, people all around the world on the price of Big Macs and uh, the price of, of uh, Starbucks coffee and things like that. Uh, and, and, and he can generate maps automatically and dynamically. This has been hugely successful in communicating with the public and engaging the public. So this is, you see, what the public was uh, originally worried about at the beginning of the downturn. The country appeared to be completely populated by Americans because they were all worried about fuel, right? Six months later, same survey, same questions, similar set of samples, and you see that the country is much more mixed with some areas, particularly in the Midlands, very worried about job security. And it's really interesting to see how you can immediately obtain information. It may not be as balanced as if you constructed a very systematic survey mechanism, but on the other hand, it's immediate and it's uh, very high volume. Um, and this is a kind of the nature of the way uh, the, the, the activities have changed enormously. You couldn't have imagined that at the start of the program. At least I couldn't have. You may have. I didn't... Uh, I put this one up to draw attention to the fact that Whilst at the beginning of the program, the arts and humanities weren't uh, directly involved, uh, they became involved, and what's more, they chose to use the word e-science um, uh, in uh, their uh, activities there. And they, for example, just started a, a, a master's course. Moving west uh, to uh, Wales and the Welsh e-science centre in Cardiff, uh, which hosted the uh, all hands meeting this year. I'm very glad to see Roger Barger there with uh, two very interesting papers from uh, Microsoft. And they uh, started, um, I think, with a sort of fairly traditional 
particle physics and computational activities moved into things like uh, support for treatment, uh, visualization, and um, also uh, healthcare at home. From that experience, Alex Hardesty particularly, who didn't produce a picture for me, and um, has done a great deal of work in the European context, both on healthcare uh, in, in, uh, and self-supporting uh, mechanisms, and uh, more importantly in various biodiversity activities in, in, in the biological or environmental sciences. And he's done this in conjunction with uh, Frank Bisbee, who's at Reading, where we go to next. But it's really important to see the way that's developed. You know, when Alex started, uh, he'd just come from uh, telecommunications industry, and I don't think he would have imagined uh, that he's now taking a leading role in shaping the infrastructure for the European environmental uh, science uh, platforms associated with the S3 roadmap. I'll come to that in a moment. So moving to Reading, where Frank Bisbee is, uh, I want to draw attention to John Blower because a week ago he had a new son, Lucas, and nevertheless produced four slides exactly as I'd asked for um, and communicated and filled in gaps during the weekend. Uh, so to me, he's one of the total heroes of the, um, uh, of the expedition. Um, but... Uh, Reading is different, you don't see a dot in the middle of the center circle here uh, because it wasn't set up in the initial program. It was set up separately uh, by the Natural Environmental Research Council to support the environmental research activities. And it's uh, had a huge uh, set of, of those things, for example, uh, using weather data and oceanographic data uh, to identify how uh, a person lost from an aircraft or something like that or a boat uh, would move uh, and therefore where to send the rescue teams, um, taking into account wave shape and so on. We've got uh, a, a whole bunch of the usual sorts of things about presenting things, but also at Reading we have other activities. For example, uh, the... Um, uh, the work of, of, of archaeologists and attempt uh, and the, their uh, plans to use um, computers actually at the dig and their challenges of the first year they tried it, the dig was mostly full of water and so uh, com computers didn't like that very much. Uh, even if they were waterproof they got muddy and difficult to use. Uh, this is a group called the White Rose Grid uh, at three universities uh, that formed a consortium which has worked very well together and I think this is, we're going to see more and more uh, consortia among universities to uh, move to more economic models of, of provisioning and, 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 and building up the staff skills. Um, this was the University of York, uh, University of Sheffield and the University of Leeds uh, led by the three characters uh, there and what I'm, uh, this is their picture of what the white rose grid is like. This is a picture of a, an initial, one of those initial pilot projects, the um, uh, DAME project which was looking at getting uh, information from aircraft engines on vibration, comparing it with their previous vibrations and deciding if something was going wrong and whether they needed maintenance. That went on to a much more uh, commercial uh, activity uh, with uh, a number of companies involved looking at the same process right through from uh, design to production uh, to in flight and that has actually uh, happened. Then you see another set of examples of, of, of engagement in carbon and uh, I'm very pleased to say that a new project has just started, uh, led from York, uh, keeping the common repository going for another four years. But it's always a challenge. And this is a collection of the, this collection of badges here 
was a collection of the um, places that, um, the, uh, that um, uh, Jim Austin uh, was saying uh, he was working with. Another outcome from the DAME project, that, that, that original aircraft monitoring project, is the Neckties project. Uh, and the, one of the people who carried uh, the ideas for that is uh, Ji Zhu, uh, who leads the e-science at Leeds. And um, the, uh, he also, um, and, and, and that is looking at, at really how to make very resilient um, grid activities. But they, he's also working closely with Behind University on uh, more work on the grid middleware. And a, a, another really interesting activity uh, is a succession of projects in, led by um, uh, Mark Birkin, uh, which is looking at, at, at making agent-based models of, of, of society so you can try and estimate, for example, how many um, places you're going to need in your hospitals for a particular kind of disease or what effect uh, a, diff a change in the transport system will make. As Tony said, to, in 2002 he started the All Hands meetings and I am very glad to say that they're still going strong and the next one in 2011 will be hosted by the White Rose Grid and it will be in York and it will be in September but they haven't chosen the exact week yet. I was trying to get them to get that up so as I could get it into your diaries uh, because it was very nice to see people from this community uh, in the All Hands meeting in Cardiff uh, this year and that would be good. So uh, the um, various labels on the map like Rutherford Appleton Laboratory um, now come under the um, heading of the uh, uh, Science and Technology Facilities uh, Council, STFC, and they host our National Grid Service, which uh, led by Neil Geddes, and uh, you can see uh, the organizations that are involved in that. But the National Grid Service runs alongside and is progressively merging with the results of Grid PP. Remember I mentioned Grid PP starting in 2001. That's gone on in every site and it seems to me it's one of the few activities which hasn't um, done as much of changing direction as the rest of us. Um, so it, it is actually, people are very pleased. I was at a party just before I came across here and I was talking to some particle physicists. They'd just been to a meeting in, uh, in um, Paris and they said everybody talked about the particle physics and nobody worried about the grid and they've got lots of real data and we're handling more data than we'd planned by this stage and it's all working and we're doing more computations and it's all working. But one of the other transitions that came is that the, the, the grid activity uh, of their activity spread out to other classes of, of, of work um, which could use the same kind of patterns uh, of work. So one, one should begin to see that these things are never local uh, alone. They're going on in the, in the context. So those funny acronyms up the top above the line are all European uh, EU data grid and EG was led by Fab over there and uh, I would have put his picture up if I'd found one uh, beside it to make certain that you knew that. And one of the, the, the things is that one can see there's been a, a, a great deal of influence. So for example, uh, the uh, e-infrastructure reflection group uh, and the uh, S3, the, uh, the, the um, European uh, Strategic uh, uh, Facilities research, re for Research Infrastructure, uh, sort of, I can't get it right in the, um, they, uh, the, these have actually started talking together after a few unsuccessful tries earlier and are actually doing some quite substantive work on shaping the e-infrastructure and there are also substantial calls from the EU towards building that. Um, and also there are current EU calls about using it and building e-science environments. Uh, so, you know, the influence can be seen and then of course, uh, as um, has been mentioned 
in Dan's talk yesterday, for example, Carol um, has led a task force which has produced a report on behalf of all the research councils uh, to the part of government that funds us to make it clear why it's necessary to have EU infrastructure as part of our provisions and why it can be done more economically if it's coordinated. And uh, that moves me on naturally to um, uh, Manchester. And Manchester is one of the fantastic places. I was trying to understand diversity and I didn't need to look very far because for anything you're thinking about from Manchester, there will be a Carol slide with it on. You just only have to scan the slides for about uh, uh, maybe an hour. Uh, that was one I came across very quickly and it said all I wanted to say really um, about the diversity, but um, to put it into the style of things we've been doing at the moment, one of the most important things, of course, uh, to come uh, from Manchester was, and they did many things, as you can see on that picture, and this shows that I'm only sampling small amounts. Uh, but one of the most important things, I think, was the MyGrid activity, uh, which Carol led, and that has led to a whole cascade of things and, and I'm sure that um, these, this is only a very poor sample, but I think it is, it is really quite important to recognize that both nationally coordinated activities like ONDEX and European-wide activities, or maybe much bigger than that, like uh, SISMO, um, have derived from those initial activities and be highly influential. And then uh, to save consuming your time for too long, one can start going into parallel and showing that there are lots of other things uh, coming out of that. But also with the, uh, with the uh, help of uh, 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 Darren, we, um, the experience of Taverna and the insights of, of Darren combined to convert the heavy-duty farming technology uh, to the more subtle horticultural technology, if we're thinking of my blooms, of the OMI UK. And this was particularly under Carol's leadership. OMI, uh, OMI was not at, uh, at Manchester, it was at Southampton, but I can't put a slide for every place. And this is, involves three sites, uh, Manchester, Southampton, and uh, Edinburgh, led by Southampton. And then uh, this has moved on to the Software Sustainability Institute. Software sustainability is incredibly important and seriously underfunded. Um, but perhaps only organizations uh, like uh, uh, big companies can afford to fund it properly. And maybe they can't. It's very difficult uh, to, to, to get that right. Um, I thought that I ought to show you a little bit about my place, but I very carefully didn't put uh, more than one side. This is uh, one of the things that we were lucky uh, to lead is the eScience Institute. My badge says I'm from the eScience Institute. I'm the director of the eScience Institute. And we provide a context uh, and support uh, for research themes, trying to dig into what's the strategy uh, for tackling some of the big questions in e-science. But we also host, hosted the 2008 Whole Hands meeting, which was chaired by Peter Coveney, who you saw some time ago, and was a very effective, uh, about 600 people, really enthusiastically talking across and between disciplines uh, in ways which I think is very valuable and hard to put together in another context. So moving on to the uh, later part of the story, um, we've got uh, a, that sample, and I've looked at a lot more slides, and I've talked to a lot more friends, and I want to try and talk about what comes out of this. Well, one of the things that comes out of this, and this is something that Jim used to say very clearly, he used to say, may all your problems be technical ones, but an alternative way of looking at this is most of our strengths are people as well. Uh, uh, so they, 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 the people and the communities you deal with are critically important, and I would like to put more pictures of people on the, uh, the slides because it's them that drive all this, and it's their interlocking activities and their mutual support that I consider to be very important. 
an, an example of that is the, the, the All Hands meeting, and, but it, much more important is the kind of organic ecosystem mix of people uh, interacting with one another in the many projects. And I think the other thing that one sees is that none of us have traveled the path we expected to travel when we started e-science um, 10 years ago. Certainly I thought I would carry on doing things with the uh, group of biologists I was doing things with at the Beetson and at uh, other parts of Glasgow University and I thought that I would go on doing things with engineers that I was doing there and I've ended up with seismologists and all sorts of other people doing rather different things than I thought I was going to. One of the great experiences of e-science is it's been an enormous roller coaster of learning and one of the things we've learned most of all is do not simplify it into it's about the big things or it's about the very complex things or it's about the very sophisticated things. It's about everything because it's what matters at the moment when someone is trying to solve a scientific challenge. And I think one of our enormous difficulties is to nurture that diversity to, to support it and yet at the same time share common technical uh, and, and, and conceptual foundations so that one can communicate and one can be efficient and, and so on. And I, I think that when, when you look at that, then the regional or the discipline-oriented uh, coordination that comes from centres is a very valuable component. I stole one of Dan's slides from his talk at the Old Hands meeting uh, because I thought it really drew attention to an important part of the, the, the balancing act that is necessary of the keeping all the interlocking parts uh, that are necessary uh, for success all moving together. And I think we should look at that um, with a great deal of care as we go forward um, because it's very easy uh, to take a short-term model and, and say we must resource uh, the, this immediate challenge and the research for it without corresponding development uh, in R&D and in cultural and social change uh, that, that will actually enable it to happen. And I, I think that, again, um, I, I, I was... Uh, I, I think that we've been seeing that for a long while, but I think it's a very important point. A, a slightly related point is the problem of the role of computer scientists. Tony referred to me as a heavyweight computer scientist, and I have to admit it, and uh, uh, he's a much improved shape. Uh, I, uh, I, I will... Um, what I would say is that there are two dynamics always going on. There are always the, the people wanting to do the computer science research and come back with the improved computing science research. And they are very much stimulated and helped by challenging applications. I think they're to be highly valued, but they're not to be exploited by being experimented on. Right? Equally, the applications often benefit from uh, computer scientists, but not always, because computer scientists sometimes come and bamboozle them instead. So it's a real challenge of getting that relationship right and keeping those two circles continuously uh, progressing or uh, advancing. And um, I copied something from someone's uh, slides on um, the extremely large database workshop uh, who said, it was Dan, um, Le Don Lemmer, um, to proceed without pride or prejudice. And I think one also has to recognise that it's a real challenge to be very careful not to uh, proceed. But the crux, as, as one understands it, is that it's necessary to proceed together. Now, before you proceed together, you've got to go through a mating process. Now, this is an endangered species, uh, this is a Scottish bird called uh, the capercaillie, 
And what you see it doing there is a lek, which means it's showing off uh, to these lady capicales here. It was rather hoping that one of them will pay attention to it and maybe uh, they'll get together. And three of the lady capicales clearly are not impressed. Um, this one is still paying attention at the moment, but whether he's got what it takes, you know, is this reminiscent of all that display at supercomputing and whether that reduces what the researchers want? In the end, the ladies choose, the researchers choose. And you can, of course, adapt, uh, and you have to adapt because their preferences change. A more formal and precise description of what you should do to look after uh, these issues uh, appears in this paper, um, but I like the picture of the Capacalis because <laughs> I like the thought of the lek. I've never seen them lek. I've seen the birds, I've seen both genders, uh, but I have not seen uh, the uh, display. I think it's critically important, and I think it's something we didn't pay enough attention to to begin with, and I think we always... Uh, tended to look f too much from the technological point of view, it's critically important to make things easy. And the most important thing about being easy is to allow people to make progress incrementally. So, you know, you, when you're learning to ride initially, it's not too risky because there's three wheels, right? And, um, you know, you might get a little help from... Um, whatever those are called in the USA, balancing wheels, or, and that's what one of my granddaughters. And then, that's not one of mine, but uh, <laughs> it's, I think it's a Microsoft soft image, and this, this needs translating because that means someone's learning to drive in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in our part of the world, but apparently it doesn't in yours. I, I don't know what the international symbol might be. And of course, eventually you get confident and you disappear down the highway. And of course, you might get rather bored with driving and jump on a bus, i.e. submit your job to the batch services. I will um, come back to that in a moment. Another um, big issue is to provide the right tools for understanding and handling and, and, and processing and looking after data. And I'm struck by an analogy with telescopes, which were... Uh, for the naked eye. And there you see the design, first recorded design of a telescope. Uh, what's that, about 16, 14 or something? 14, 17, I've, I've got it on my slides, but... Uh, sorry, 1611. And there is the produced telescope in use, and you see an obs early observer uh, doing the first sky survey. And there is a, what you might call a design for another telescope and uh, the corresponding Hubble in flight and this is the results of a third telescope and so on. And here uh, one sees looking at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and, and then one sees an organisation for bringing them all together. Look at the travel, the distance of travel from here to here in our intellectual journey and think about what it could be like if we could build tools for ourselves to take advantage of the data. And so I think it's really important that we invest in that. And so I'm very glad to announce that Microsoft have been investing in it because they've got a data scope of their very own and uh, so have a few others now and I, 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 I'm I want to commend them on, on this because it, I think it's not only a data scope, but I think it's also a RAM because it gets people to being able to use something in a context in which is already familiar and uh, incrementally uh, progress into uh, 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 understanding it. So the, the digital revolution is highly disruptive and um, I don't know how much it's going to disrupt, but we see uh, data is one of the symptoms. And there is the story, of, as far as I can construct it, of occurrences of data-intensive events up, up until now. Quite a lot of them, 
not all labelled data intensive, but uh, you know, and this is clearly the one that Alex who was probably here somewhere, and 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 Jim and others from Microsoft did a, invested a great deal of effort. Um, but you know, I see the the story of successive meetings about how to handle and, and share data and then the publication of the two papers in Nature and Science simultaneously is a real effort in r exploiting data. Be without a great deal of shared data, those projects could not have worked around the world with so many people involved. And uh, one of the things that uh, Tony wisely did when he was running the program was to set up the Data Curation Center. And it uh, tries to talk about some of the stories uh, of, of, of what, you, what you need to do in this world. And uh, I was very struck by uh, this particular report from the USA, and I came across last year to, uh, as a result of that. And uh, there's now a report by Dave Derure and myself, uh, which I haven't got a front page for yet because I haven't got a front page design. Uh, but um, uh, we do have uh, the, the, these, these stories. And, and, of course, I should put the latest blog on there, and we're running a data-intensive research theme at the eScience Institute now. So we are concerned with empowering all researchers and then meeting their needs. And the better we empower them, the bigger their needs, and the harder it is to meet them. So it's, not, it's going to be a never-ending story. Surprise, surprise. So, what's the take-home message? We're at the start of a digital revolution. I believe it's more profound than any, and more disruptive than any we've ever encountered before. Because it's happening concurrently throughout the world. And previously, we had a little industrial revolution in one corner of Britain, and then it happened somewhere else, and then it happened somewhere else. But the, or printing happened in Germany and then it came to Britain and so on. These, this one is happening everywhere. And the other thing is that there are three or four very powerful feedback loops all combining. So it's going to be very turbulent. And I think we're at the very beginning of it. It's going to change everything about the way we organize and think and what we do. And of course, I would argue that e-science, which is systematically thinking about how we use uh, computational methods and computational thinking to understand things and to do better at handling them, uh, that I, I consider that it is key to the story. And I think we're in a continuous journey to understand and exploit the new niches as they occur, because that digital revolution is driven by the commodities. It's driven by... Uh, commerce, it's driven by companies like Microsoft, it's driven by all sorts of mechanisms, none, no one of which nobody fully understands. And so what one has to be doing is observing and finding ways of surviving in that context. I would argue that organizations like centers are crucial for e-science. I was very struck when I visited uh, when uh, Dave and I visited uh, the Earth um, Data Analysis Center at Albuquerque, uh, which had been, was set up by NASA about 45 years ago. Uh, and then when we later uh, went to Boulder and went to NCAR, um, the, there are two centers which demonstrate the value of building skills and knowledge and, uh, and, and providing a clear beacon where people can find that knowledge when they need it. <coughs> so I would say that the value of the e-science centers is that they are the place where the, the, they are the gardens where the diversity is kept and it's diversity that you need in uh, the turbulent times of change as um, Darwin so clearly said. A further, further plug for the uh, old hands meeting they asked uh, this coming year, and just a little mention that the last old hands meeting, I think this is Dan Atkins talking there, um, which was in Cardiff, was also in a beautiful, um, very nicely uh, appointed uh, building uh, of uh, a Victorian vintage. 
I don't know that we're doing it in the cathedral, um, but if the, the, we're supposed to be doing it in a new building, which is supposed to be finished in time, so we may have to use the, the cathedral if it isn't ready. Well, I'd like to thank all those people that did contribute, and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Well, we've got some time for uh, a few questions uh, about uh, the UK's journey over the last 10 years. Pat? Pat Langley, Arizona State University. Um, so uh, I thought it was very interesting that there was a, a number of groups you didn't mention in this who had been working on, it, it, which is, I think, interesting given given the, the emphasis these days on data intensive science. People who have been using uh, methods from machine learning to discover scientific knowledge, they've been working on this since the mid-90s at least. Uh, I'm thinking about Stephen Muggleton's group uh, originally at York and now at Imperial College, Ross King at, uh, at Aberystwyth. Uh, these are groups that seem not to be part of the, the, uh, the UK e-science movement, even though arguably they've been doing e-science for a long time. So I'm not, I'm, you're gonna over, I'm sure there are other groups you left out. I simply wanted to mention them because they are, have been focused for a very long time on, on discovering scientific knowledge in data. And I'm curious about how <clears throat> that sub-movement did not fall, you know, become part of the e-science, uh, broader e-science movement, because I think it belongs there. Uh, well, first of all, I totally agree with your final comment that it belongs there. Um, secondly, um, I would very happily include all of bioinformatics or ex-informatics. They're not, they're not informaticians. They're, they're, well, they're, no, they're but, machine learning researchers, but yeah. Yeah, I know. I know, um, I know some of them personally. Uh, but I, I would also, um, and I also know people who've been doing that kind of work for a very long while in astronomy and uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 in medical systems as well. Uh, I think the challenge um, of e-science is to become much more of an open church we, we, and not look like a threat. I, I think that people are very resistant to change and very worried about names. Uh, you know, they do not want their territory taken over. And, and so I think there was kind of a lot of silos and partitions which we build. I think they're totally disastrous to our science and our culture. And uh, my, my delight would be if I knew of an intellectual bulldozer I could add to my intellectual ramp and my data scope which would get rid of barriers. But my experience is that they're very hard to get rid of in the current generation, particularly people mm, as ancient as me, but also within 20 years of my age. But generally speaking, you can impregnate the younger generation if you do it through the education. And I think a, a key issue is how we address these. You know, I'd like to make certain that everybody coming out of any degree in, in, in a university ha was to some extent a data scientist, was to some extent aware of statistics and, well, and methods like that, at least so as they could have the conversations. Well, so my, yeah, my guess is that what was really going on was that when e-science first got going, it was more on the, the simulation and modeling side and less on the data intensive side. So the people who were active on the data side were, were not as included. And now that it, uh, it's come, come around that that it's time to... I, I think that's, that's more the case in the USA than it is really? in the UK. Okay. We were very data-oriented, um, but um, if you actually look at the sum of money that we're, we're talking about, uh, less than uh, half a billion dollars over five years spread over all subjects, it was a very small amount of money to have change, and I think it, it did have a remarkable amount of change for them for the investment. Um, of course, it would have been wonderful if one could have engaged more people. But I, I, what I find is, and I, I said it on one of the slides, e-science is done by individuals. And what happens is one person starts talking to another. They're at some course. The universities insisted they go to to find out how to do appraisal or something like that. 
they're sitting next to someone from another discipline, they start talking to one another, and they go off, and, and, and things develop from there. They, it, people have to be got together, and we've done all sorts of things to try and get people together, but generally speaking, only the engaged come to the meetings. So it's serendipity to get people together. We do then have to set up the right environment so that those flowers grow from these new cross-pollinations. And that is going to be really quite difficult because the current environment, you know, wants you to be an isolated person working in your silo. Just a correction. Actually, I ran the GIST Committee for Supportive Research and Ross King was the biology rep on that, and it was his input that led to the National Center for Text Mining. But, but it was clear that there was a fair amount of skepticism from that community, but he did participate, uh, and he yeah. was responsible for the Text Mining Center. Any, any other questions for Malcolm? I don't want the break. So I, I have one uh, before the break, which is, uh, is there any hope in the current UK economic climate that there will be continued funding for, for the e-science initiative? Well, one of the reasons I chose some of the centres that I did is that they seem to go on uh, bringing in resources without getting any kind of core funding. Cardiff is most spectacular in that example. Um, but so... Uh, I think, I think Wales and Scotland have unfair advantage because they get... They get national funding. Well, actually, almost all the money in Cardiff is coming from Europe, but never mind. Uh, the, um, the, but the other thing that I, I think is that Carol's report, I, I believe, will be influential because at the moment, you know, we're going to see a government which believes that bang for buck is important, and I think coordination, which has been sadly lacking since you left, I hope you've managed to achieve it inside Microsoft like you did for us. Um, but um, it, it's, it has been lacking, and I think that when that is resourced, I, I think that will then provide the right environment uh, for making the business and science cases. Um, I, we obviously have to compete with everybody else, and I think it's going to be a tough competition for the next three or four years. My own goal is to get people uh, engaged in making certain they get through to the end of the tunnel because if during downturns, if you do the right things, then you can emerge ahead at the, uh, uh, at the far end of that, um, uh, that process. And so I'm really keen to get uh, uh, people maintaining uh, at least the skeleton crew, which is keeping the skill base there and keeping the knowledge base there. Because it's the people knowledge, it's the people with their knowledge and skills that matter. And it's losing them that I really worry about. Okay, so um, in the US, where, where the, the, the White House is very focused on data, data intensive science, data collections and so on. I think that will be reflected in some initiatives by NSF and that might also help. We'll it usually see. does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and just, just as a comment, my own personal journey was in 2001, the first thing I did was actually reach out to my friends at IBM, Irving Gradowski Berger, and a certain, what was the name of the guy? Darren Jeff. Green. Oh, him, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, in 2001. Uh, but I also met Jim Gray in 2001, and then I began a personal journey, because I'd never even contemplated that Microsoft may have things to offer in this space. And I've come down to the view that actually Microsoft could offer a lot if it behaves with open source, interoperability, standards, and so on. So I think we've some way to go, but I think there's great potential for really getting great benefits and Microsoft can be a player. That's what I would like to achieve. But anyway, um, I think we should give Malcolm uh, one last round of applause before we have the break. Thank you very much. <laughs>